Welcome everyone to our September webinar, Opportunities for Agent Network Development, and we're expecting a, a pretty large turnout today, and I'd like to thank everyone for participating in the, the session. Uh, let me begin with a brief overview on how the webinar will be run, and then I'll introduce our facilitator. Uh, my name is Jessica Alfaro. Many of you know me from Capital Plus Exchange. I'm a manager here, and I'm very pleased to have met with or communicated with many of you through um, previous activities and happy to meet the rest of you today. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, here's a little bit more information on Cap Plus. Capital Plus Exchange enables financial institutions in emerging markets to serve small businesses more effectively and profitably dedicated to increasing people's economic opportunities by strengthening financial services to small businesses, CAP Plus provides financial institutions with strategic and operational capacity building, training and peer learning, and pilots of innovative solution to expand markets. For this webinar, we have muted all the voice lines going through to improve the sound quality, but we do encourage you to participate fully throughout the webinar. Please do submit your questions as we're going through the webinar by typing them into the chat box on the GoToWebinar app on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, we'll also be opening up the, the voice lines during the discussion period for a couple institutions who are going to share a bit about the work that they're doing in agent banking and in agent networks. Let me share a little bit more about our facilitators before we begin as well. Greg Chen, lead for CGAP in Asia and works to deepen CGAP's engagement across eight countries in South Asia with a focus on the role of technology. Pablo Garcia Aravete is CGAP's regional representative for Latin America and the Caribbean and works in the intersection of mobile technologies, business model innovation and development. For um, our upcoming webinars, we have two more for the end of the year, uh, one on risk and one on HR. And so we do encourage you to sign up for those at our website, and you can take a look at those descriptions there. And at this point in time, I will turn it over to Greg and Pablo. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. This is this is Greg Chen. Um, thanks to uh, uh, to Capital Plus Exchange. Uh, I've, I've had the pleasure of knowing this group for a number of years and been able to attend a number of the events and I, I've learned a lot uh, across those exchanges so it's, it's really a, a real pleasure today to be able to, to join a lot of you in different places across, uh, across the globe for a discussion around agent networks. Um, just a little bit of background on what we hope to cover during this which is uh, CGAP, as some of you may know, is, is really a global public resource on financial inclusion. And we've uh, had a theory and uh, been doing work on agents for probably close to eight or ten years. Um, and it maybe the biggest early piece of work was something called the Agent Network Toolkit. Um, which came out maybe five, six years ago. And, and we sort of put that to bed thinking, well, we've done our bit of work on agents and let's move on to some other things. But as we've moved down the road, the use of agents has become even more prevalent, uh, more widespread, but it's also raised important new interesting issues. So we're into other kind of work. How do you get smartphone apps into the hands of agents so that they can better do their business? Um, Pablo leads a, a piece of work for CGAP around how to push agent networks out into much more rural, difficult to reach areas. So I, I, I think this is a topic, an area in, in the financial sector that is, is likely to perhaps become even, even more important and more interesting and more complex in the years ahead. Um, we definitely see it as a, a permanent, increasingly uh, uh, permanent and relevant part of the financial sector in most every country that we that we work, although it's quite uneven. Um, I think in terms of what we want to cover here, I think there's going to be um, a broad look at some trends and issues across agent networks that Pablo will take us through. We understand that many of you already use agents and are uh, some of you are already quite involved in, in um, uh, using agents in your systems. Some of it may depend on the regulations in your respective countries. 
when we talk about agents, we're primarily talking of agents that do the basic cash in and cash out transactions. Although sometimes agents start to do more in terms of giving advice and being a little bit more of an extension of a financial institution. Um, so just with that as background, um, I'm going to turn it over to Pablo and we're really going to try and keep the presentation to, to 30 minutes um, and, and then really get into a discussion we hope at the end of all of that. So let me, let me turn it over to Pablo here who, who can take us through uh, the presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, Jessica, and Capitalas for the opportunity of uh, showing some of the research and that we are doing on, on agent networks at a, at a global uh, scale. So, um, my name is Pablo Garcia. As it, was said, as it was said before, I work mostly in Latin America, but lately I have been uh, engaging in, in projects in India, in Africa, uh, so I, we were trying to to, to do like a, a second uh, wave of this uh, agent research that enables agent networks and, and financial providers to, to go beyond and expand their, their agent networks uh, even further. So, so let's uh, let's start with the first slide. The idea here is to uh, not extend this presentation more than 20 minutes. And then, uh, as it is a very broad audience uh, from a global perspective, uh, just try to use most of the time uh, to have a discussion and, and see what the different uh, perspectives and, and views are on this. So, uh, just we're going to talk about the first of all the agent network value chain to understand and, and put a common ground out there of what we're talking about. Uh, and then we're going to see just a, a, a more of a theoretical landscape with some examples of how is this challenge being addressed. Uh, at, the, at the business model level uh, from in different parts of the world. Then we're going to look at some growth drivers in terms of what is the fuel that can make uh, an agent network grow better, what, what we are seeing out there. And uh, last but not least, although we won't pay much attention to that today because I don't think it's at the core of the webinar, we're going to have some, have some reference to the regu regulatory overview. So let's start th then with the value chain. Uh, Greg, do you want to add something at this point? No, Pablo, sounds good. Um, I think we should carry on. Great. So, you've probably seen this image that uh, we're showing on this next slide, uh, probably in, uh, adapted to your local reality, but this is what uh, agents uh, look more or less like uh, everywhere. The, the rationale behind uh, agent networks is to leverage an, an existing uh, retail infrastructure and try to use that infrastructure to start uh, processing financial transactions and expand the access point network to financial services. So uh, what we are seeing around the world is that there are a few transactions which uh, centralize most of the uh, volume that these uh, agents process. And also, Number one, or one of the most important, is peer-to-peer -peer transfers. We have a uh, bill payment as well, and then what we call cash in, cash out, uh, which this can be made either to uh, a formal bank account, a full-fledged bank account in many countries, or it can be uh, to a wallet uh, or, a, or a simplified account or a mobile wallet, depending how it, this is called in in different countries, and also what is the main means of interaction. Airtime is also a, a big part of the revenue of agents, although this is many times uh, not associated directly to the banking or financial agent business, but what we find out there is if they usually do a financial services or banking a agent a function, they are also probably doing airtime, and that's also a, a more limited financial transaction, which is a payment, but also an important part of the revenue. Some uh, companies around the world uh, make a big effort to maintain, especially if they are MNOs, to maintain their airtime uh, network separated uh, from the banking agent or the cash in cash out agent network because of the differences on commissions on, on each side. 
So going to the to the next slide. You know, so what's what's the role of the agent? What's the what's the day-to-day -day operation? So there are basically three three parties that are engaged in a in a transaction. We have of course the agent. Uh, we have a, a financial provider or bank on one side, and we have of course a client or, or a customer on the other side. So uh, once there is, in, in the case of a cash in cash out, once there is once there is an an open account, either a, a simplified mobile wallet, mobile phone account, or a, a regular bank account, uh, then the, the the customer is able to through the agent uh, do either cash in or cash out transactions, uh, which at the, at the on the on the say on the other way or on the on the flip side they are a uh, account being uh, transferred electronically. So if a customer goes into an agent and does a cash in of let's say ten dollars, those ten dollars will be credited automatically and in real time to the uh, account of the customer which very likely the customer will be able to uh, be notified or, or check that on their uh, mobile phone. And so this electronic value is sent in, in layman uh, terms to the wallet or mobile phone. Pablo, uh, if I yes. could just make a quick comment here, just on, and I don't know if this is obvious in all markets where Capital Plus Exchange partners work, but the key point on, on some of this is that the, the agent is never holding the float of the customer and the agent's position is pre-funded and so therefore that has two implications. One is that the client's funds are always with the financial institution, not the agent. But the other is that the agent is not being compensated on float, they're being compensated on commission. Um, that's not the case everywhere but that is the most common uh, arrangement that we see. Yes, excellent. So, um, uh, one one last comment on what Greg was saying. So, the the agent account, which has been prepaid, this is the number forty on the slide, uh, has been debited. So, this uh, is very important on a from a risk basis that uh, many agent networks require their agents to prepay or put up from the, the working capital uh, for their operation, so that there's there are no uh, problems down the line. Um, good. So then we we're going to the, to the next slide just to give you a, a sense. This, this data is not probably the most updated one, but it gives a, a powerful sense of the different roles that agent networks, like like the one we are we are mentioning here or or describing, uh, have in different countries. Though for for example, in some countries like Brazil or Kenya, uh, agents are a huge uh, part of the uh, financial access points uh, of the overall financial system. Uh, while in some others, uh, agents are there, but they have not yet picked up. Uh, so the, the idea here is to show the, the potential that, uh, as you, of course, uh, I guess all of you may know, uh, it's, it's a very, very big uh, opportunity in terms of uh, expanding access uh, and access points uh, through a model that requires not a lot of uh, capital expenditures because, uh, for example, compared to ATMs, you are already leveraging the existing infrastructure and this is not like a bank branch or an ATM where you need to invest and, and build it first. This, uh, the agents are already there. The idea is to activate them as well as a, a financial access points. Greg, do you want to add something here? No, I think the I think one of the main differences between the countries that have a lot of agents and those that don't is really regulation. And uh, I suspect, in fact, I know that in the case of Indonesia and Egypt, we do have some regulatory problems. Whereas in Brazil and Kenya, the regulators have have figured out how to have this happen. So a lot of that is about regulation. Uh, but let's carry on, Pablo. Good. Yeah. Good. So then, just, uh, just simply uh, detail the value chain of uh, agent networks. We have the, uh, a financial service provider that uh, requires or is in need of uh, processing financial transactions or making this possibility available to the customers. Uh, then we have an agent network operator 
uh, this is a, a, a function, and we we're going to see how this might work. This is a, a role that a, a platform that connects all these dispersed access points uh, plays, which is usually coupled with the team that serves these points, visits them, and as, uh, at the same time may acquire new points. Then we have the access points, which are these retail locations that we're where all the transactions uh, in the form of cash take place. And finally, of course, the user. Uh, who uh, the, the benefit of using agent is mostly the idea of proximity. They need to move less, go farther away from their homes or the place where they work in order to uh, make these transactions happen. So going to the next slide uh, and the next section, now we're going to look at how the four main pieces of the puzzle of agent networks come together and uh, how we are seeing these four pieces uh, being uh, shaped in different ways uh, across different markets. So no, no matter what, uh, who is running the network, what is the type of transaction that is going to be the focus of the operation, if it's more cash in or more cash out or more bill payments, you, you need, uh, to, in order to make an agent network successful, you need four functions, four roles which are usually uh, accomplished by, uh, around the world by banks, by MNOs, by agent network operators, and by retailers, which were the, the four elements of the, of the value chain we were mentioning before. So if you want to run an agent network, uh, you need to do some cash management. Some, someone needs to do that. You need to, to connect uh, through some uh, telco infrastructure uh, those uh, far away or dispersed access points to a centralized platform, so you need this connectivity. Uh, you need, of course, the physical location that the agents represent because the, the, the transactions need to take place somewhere, so you need a physical space. And uh, you need uh, to keep on expanding this network and uh, servicing and, and uh, picture your agents also as customers and make sure that they are doing things right and you make sure that they are th doing things the way you want them. So, these are, are the four functions that are needed uh, in an, in an, for the operation of an agent network. And we're going to see next how these functions are performed in different countries and uh, who is leading the operation of the network. And now that many of you work in banks, you're going to see that uh, darker blue section of, of the pie, which says bank there. Just one, one caveat here. This does not mean that uh, the bank should be limited uh, to this function in each of these uh, months we're going to see. It just shows the way they are being, uh, they are adding to this value chain, but it, it could be any other way around. And any of these models that you are seeing here, they could be uh, either uh, operated, hired, or contracted by any bank. So we, we need to separate the, the operational side of the business model, which we are showing here, from the possibility of working with any of these networks we're going to see next. Uh, Greg, do you want to add something at this point? No, uh, I didn't carry on, Pablo. Good. So uh, we are, we're starting here with the probably the more typical in terms of, of the high-profile uh, internationally that, that M-PESA has uh, around the world. So this is how the M-PESA agent network is operated. Uh, it's a very successful network in terms of volume and agents. M-PESA has a bit more than 85,000 agents. And the, the MNO uh, is, is, is the one articulating the whole business model. But it, it, is, it is working with banks at the same time. It's working with retailers. And it, it has an agent network operator uh, structure. Uh, sorry, and yeah, an agent network operator structure in terms of, of uh, having to deal uh, through some intermediaries with the agents that they run. So what we are seeing here is how the, the four pieces of the pie we saw before are uh, being uh, operated. So uh, M-Pesa controls the agent network operators, which are these intermediaries, which work exclusively for them, uh, and they are the ones. Uh, going directly to the access points and making them uh, run smoothly, uh, they they have through this agent uh, operator intermediaries 
uh, access to these retailers through, through some type of service contract agreement. We're not going to go into the details. But at the same time, even this is a, a mobile money-led uh, model and all that we hear very often, uh, banks are an essential part of, of these, and, uh, and, and they are an essential part in terms mostly of the cash management and the, the, the treasury service and the safety of the fund. So whatever money goes through uh, MPESA, it usually ends up in, in a bank account where it will be safeguarded and where um, and, and as MPESA is not allowed to intermediate those funds, the bank will hold those funds and will be able to intermediate them uh, as they are authorized to do so. So this is a model where the MNO is at the center of the articulation of these same four pieces. Um, so we go to the next slide now and we have an example from Brazil from uh, Caixa which is one of the largest uh, state-owned banks there. Uh, Caixa has uh, are almost 30,000 agents and it is the same model, the same four pieces of the puzzle, but here the bank is playing the leading role. So uh, the um, Kaisha has, a, of course, an agent operator a department or network that works mostly with what, what they call lotericas, which are um, these uh, lottery small shops, which are, I would say, the, the, the core of the uh, retail network o o operation there. And then we have as well uh, the retails, which are the lotericas and some other type of, of businesses. And of course, we need an, an MNO or some kind of, of telco service because uh, those lotericas or those access points need to be connected to the uh, agent bank, agent banking platform of the bank. So uh, this is uh, what they what they do is simply hiring as a in, in the, as a service contract. And they uh, they work with MNOs uh, for the most uh, remote uh, locations, and they work with a uh, probably broadband with the for the most uh, urban uh, locations of their retailers. So what we are seeing here is the same four pieces again restructured in a different way, where the bank plays a different model. And we're going to see how this goes on the uh, exclusivity side. Or a question would be: Would uh, Kaisha uh, be willing to? accept some other bank uh, transactions in order uh, to process them through their agents. So would, would Kaisha work on an exclusive basis or would they be willing to uh, take other bank as a, as a customer who uses the agent network? We're going to see that in a moment. Greg, do you want to add something at this point? No, I, I would just say uh, we have about 10 minutes left in the presentation, yes. so we should target uh, uh, getting to some of the questions. Yes. So then we have the, I'm going to the next slide, the OXO uh, model. Uh, OXO is a, a retail store, a convenience store, which is the, like, I, have, I know if, just to give you an example that some of you may know, is a 7-Eleven type of store. Now you have uh, from uh, some basic groceries to like daily, daily mass, uh, fast moving consumer goods. And uh, of course, they also work as a as a financial uh, agent. So in this case, the same four pieces are led by uh, OXO themselves, which is a retail store. And uh, OXO is very willing to work with more than one bank in terms of processing their transactions. Uh, more than six banks can do cash in, cash out at uh, OXO retail stores in Mexico, which are uh, around uh, fourteen thousand these days. Um, so uh, part of the business model as a agent, uh, as agents, is to uh, work with the with the more amount, with the largest amount of banks possible because that increases their volume. And of course, they need uh, communications. They are their own uh, agent network operator because they, they work with their own access points. And they need banks as a, as part of the operational model. They need to put uh, the money they collect in bank accounts in order to keep it safe and make a better best use of it. Going to the, the next business model, this is from uh, Oxygen in India. Uh, this is uh, the same puzzle with the four pieces, but here the uh, agent network operator, which we could call also an aggregator, uh, is uh, uh, running the operation. In, in this case, they are also very willing to work with any bank, and they also need retailers, they need uh, connectivity of their bonds, and they need banks too, because they need bank accounts in order to manage their liquidity and their cash operation. 
So these are four very different models which we are seeing around the world where the same question of how to operate agents uh, is, is being answered in different ways. So uh, we can talk uh, more in depth about this in the, in the question, but so which, bond, which business model uh, should a, a bank or a financial institution work with? So if you are thinking either of launching your own agent at work or, or hiring an existing one. So I think there are here uh, three main considerations to keep in mind, and we can discuss this uh, further later, but one of them is the, the stage of market de development. If, if the market is already full of uh, agents and agent network operators are all over the place, if you want to launch your own network, it will be very costly because you would need to acquire uh, agent locations that probably are already working with someone else, and that would uh, have an additional cost. On the other side, you, you need to make some consideration about the strategic value of reaching the agent directly in terms of your overall business. Do you, do you really need to uh, be on the street uh, and branding uh, some access points with your brand because of your special niche or your segment or your type of product? That's another consideration. And uh, the other one is this uh, idea that uh, agents are generally very good at managing cash in terms of doing cash in, doing cash out, collecting bill payments, but in general they are not very good at selling because they are always usually or, or not always but usually doing something else and, and making a sales push takes more effort uh, and it's probably not what they are willing to do if they are doing their daily operation at their, at their grocery store for example. So that's a consideration to keep in mind. Uh, what are you focusing at? And either if you need to deploy a separate agent network that only sells or one that only collects. So there's a, um, a question about priority there. But we'll talk about this later. Let me let me check the time here. Yeah, good. So um, what we're seeing around the world are mostly uh, two drivers for the growth of agent networks. The the, the agent networks that that perform and grow. Uh, well, of course, this is not, of course, the only way to do it. MPSA is growing, and they don't do a, a either of these. But what we are seeing as, a, as an innovative trend coming is, on, on, one, on the one hand, the aggregation. So this is working with multiple providers. What we are seeing, for example, in, in Peru is that uh, agent networks run by a bank are also willing to take bill payments and credit card payments from other banks. So this is seeing that they are understanding their business not only as a, as a competitive differentiator, but also as a business in itself. So they are willing to take even transactions from competitors uh, at certain levels to uh, make their agent networks have more volume. And on the other hand is this idea of service level tiering in the sense that the, the more requirements that you put on, on your operational model, for example, uh, reading fingerprints, the higher the cost that, that would be to operate. And the, the less agents you will be able to have around because the uh, transactional level to which the agent will have to reach would be too high and many of your existing agents would not make it there. So there's a trade-off and this idea of service level tiering, having very light model agents enables you a fast deployment uh, which probably has some, some limitations, for example, in the, in the maximum value of the transactions but in the end, you get coverage first, and then you can start building from there uh, some uh, the, the the process of more complex transactions. So just two charts to finish. Uh, I, I will let this by. This one explains just the all the pools of transactions that are there at any given point. You have like bill payments on one side, airtime on the other. So the the more you move to the center, your business model moves, or, or the one or the agent network you are working with move to the center of these different transactional pools, the more you will aggregate and the more the largest portion of that ideal transactional pool that your agent network will be able to process. On the other hand, uh, these transactions can be uh, either exclusive or not. So, as I was saying, we, we can discuss it later, but M-Pesa only runs their own transactions. Kaisha is exclusive on some things and not exclusive on others. And OXO and Oxygen as aggregators they, they are very willing to work with it. And as I was saying before, this idea of tiering, uh, we have different levels. So if you want to give out paper receipts to all of your customers, that will have an operational impact. So you need to choose 
the, the weight of your operational model, which will impact your ability to go farther uh, out into rural areas or, or operate at a, at a good profit or at least at a break-even point with a fewer transactions. And just uh, to finish with, uh, on the regulatory side, uh, there are uh, probably three levels where the, the regulation uh, is focusing at. No? So there is, uh, of course, the, the, the one you know very well as uh, financial institutions. There is regulation that is specifically aimed toward financial institutions and in the, the later years toward e-money issuers, depending on the country, they usually have a different status. Then you have the agent, which is this new channel, and then you have a, a concern about the, of course, the, the safeguarding of the customer and also about fraud. So these are the, the three levels where the agent regulation uh, is uh, concerned at. So going to the, to the next slide, there are three main risks here, the operational risks that have to do mostly with, with fraud, with uh, the safety of funds. Um, then you have consumer risk, you, you want consumers to know exactly what they're doing, how much they're paying, uh, and not, not making mistakes, for example, in, in sending money to someone else who, who's not the person they were aiming at. And, and then also uh, regulators are, are concerned about uh, the, the typical problems of, of KYC and, and the financing of terrorist activities and money laundering. And of course, this is very dependent on every market. No? Some markets are very concerned about terrorist finance activities, while others are not because that's not a big problem in their country. So this is very much of a, of a local balance that is uh, uh, out there. Good, so I think, uh, and this idea we were mentioning of exclusivity and non-exclusivity of agents from a regulatory perspective, there's a trade-off between incentives for investment if the agents are not there, and if they are there to in some way share the access of, of, to this infrastructure in order to, to make a more of a competitive market. So uh, I think this would be for now, Greg. Uh, I did a bit of a rush on the last uh, regulation section. Uh, would you want to add something on top of that? No, I mean, we're happy to talk more on the regulation, but there may be other questions that take on top of that. I think um, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a question there, which, which maybe, uh, maybe I can take. Um, uh, why don't we go ahead with that? Great. Tabitha uh, from Zimbabwe. Tabitha, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can. can you, yes, uh, my question you, is... Which, uh, you which institution you're from in your role as well? FBC Bank. FBC Bank, Zimbabwe. Great. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, my issue is... Uh, you know, uh, I think initially you were talking of uh, you know, lack of uh, maybe flow, uh, uh, cash flows within the agents in some of the um, African countries, for example, um, in which case you'd want to pre-fund the agent. But how can you secure the pre-funding? Because uh, we have had issues where uh, some agents will just disappear with the money that you would have, uh, uh, you would have given them. Um, how can you how can you uh, secure that? So, Sabatha, thank you. Um, this is Greg here. Um, so, in, in in most environments, and and Pablo maybe can speak more widely, but in most environments that I'm familiar with, the agent to be authorized as an agent for a provider would need to actually mm -hmm. pre-fund themselves by making a deposit in your bank. And so there's no funds okay. for, the, for the financial institution. The tricky part is, how do you convince them to pre-fund? You have to promise them or suggest that there's a future commission revenue by doing cash in and cash mm -hmm. out. So to get them to make the mm -hmm. pre-funded deposits, it's a little bit of a, a sequencing game. There need to be enough customers um, who will do some cash in and cash out. How do you sequence that? That's part of the, 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 the tricky side of this business. You also need customers who will start to do transactions and therefore the agents feel it's justified to leave a deposit with you. 
but we don't see you funding the, the agents. The agents are actually depositing with you. Okay. Yeah, on, on my side, just yeah. a, a, a brief moment here. Uh, it does happen everywhere in the world, as you were saying, that agents run away with the money. That has been seen almost <laughs> anywhere. So that, that is why one of the easiest ways to counter this is using the, the prepaid strategy that you were mentioning. But on the, on the operational side, there's a, a, a letdown of the, of the strategy, which is that uh, many agents will hit their transactional limit uh, during the day, and they will not be able to keep on transacting. And in the end, your customers will, will be suffering, and they will lose uh, some confidence in your, in your agent network. So uh, what, what we are seeing is that because of this, uh, and the idea of, of service tiering is out there, is, is gaining some, some steam. So you, you probably divide your agent network and, and use the 10% the of your best agents, which you know them, you are, they are trustworthy. They depend a lot of, on you because they make a lot of money from you because they're really good at it. Uh, so once, once you enter that, that phase where you know the agents, they make a lot of transactions, they're good, they, and they are dependent on you, in that saying, you can start uh, probably give them some credit. Uh, and if you give them some credit, um, you can start to uh, have this hybrid model where most of your, net, of your network is on a prepaid basis, but your best and most trustworthy uh, points of sale are uh, having some kind of line of credit. Either given by the network operator, if you are a bank, then it will be directly by yourself. And many times, and I, I've seen this in, in a small country in, in Latin America, in, in Paraguay, where a, a third party bank is assuming the cost of a working capital loan and, and the risk, of course. So uh, I would say that this idea of tiering uh, would be one of the upcoming trends. OK. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you. My pleasure. Great. OK, thank you so much, Tabitha. And we actually have a, um, a couple institutions who have, uh, we have a variety of institutions at, at different stages of implementing um, agent banking and using agent networks. And one of our partners in India um, is going to share a little bit about their experience in doing this. Um, Manish, can you hear, hear us OK? Yes, absolutely. Uh, this is Manish, yeah. Great. Can so, you tell us what uh, institution everybody... you're from and your role at the institution? Sure. Uh, I work for an organization called General Electric Financial Services. Uh, I don't know if everybody is aware, but General Electric is in the country currently. We basically provide uh, loans to women only, and uh, the concept is basically joint liability group loans. So that's that's what we do. We have been issued a small finance bank license recently, and uh, we would be launching our bank uh, shortly. Uh, I head the agent banking business for General Electric Financial Services, uh, which is you know as everywhere else is. Uh, to create financial inclusion, um, particularly for our own customers who are our own customers and are at the at that end of the customer segmentization where financial and banking services are not easy to easy for them to get to. So our uh, vision mission is basically to uh, provide uh, banking, financial, and payment services to our captive audience network, which is pretty large at the moment. We are currently 6 million and growing rapidly. Um, the, other, uh, uh, the other objective of setting up this network is to uh, enable uh, availability of an ubiquitous uh, distribution channel for other good businesses to ride on. We have many other businesses apart from small batch loan. We've got enterprise financial services loan and so on and so forth, and agri loans and launching a bank will be retail banking, corporate banking, and so on and so forth. At at each uh, each of these businesses will uh, be able to drive value from the distribution channel that I'm setting up in terms of value addition, revenue generation, cost optimization, or operational efficiencies. 
Uh, and the third objective that we are basically trying to achieve through this, through developing this network, is to um, create a destination for the customer that we are targeting. Because at the end of the day, you know, there are financial services, there are banking services, there are payment services, and then merchant services, which is basically acceptance of. We also have a, a mobile wallet called Jana Cash. So our again objective is to uh, uh, that. Uh, all these agents also become merchants, and the customers are able to transact through uh, the Jana Cash wallet at these merchants. So basically, trying to create these points, as we call them, Jana Cash points, as the destination for a customer's, or, you know, needs to a very large extent. Uh, so that, in a nutshell, is 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 what we do. Um, um, I'm. This is a very young business. I joined this organization about 15 months ago. Uh, we actually started building the network only in April this year. And we're moving along, uh, hoping to get there. Any questions? Yes, uh, here uh, Pablo Garcia again. Yeah, I would be interested to know how many agents you have right now. Currently we have a network of about 1,500. And in, in sorry, maybe you said that I'm in which uh, region of India? So we are uh, we have operations as an organization about 200 odd cities. Uh, we are focusing on uh, the urban poor sector uh, in the uh, metros and A plus cities. So currently our spread is around in around 10 cities. Uh, we have a, a densification model wherein we basically follow. Uh, those markets where uh, our uh, loan customers are. So, um, depends on the customer density, we then follow that particular geography. And quick question, uh, Manish, are the agents purely on a commission basis compensated or are they, is there some kind of fixed fee as well that you, that you how is the business model for them? No, so it's purely commission. It's but but the objective is to provide a slew of uh, services and products for them to be able to achieve a threshold. So we internally have a threshold uh, and also a KPI in terms of uh, making sure that X percentage of our agents, which is pretty high, uh, make at least X amount of money. So there is there is a program around it, and <clears throat> that is being uh, fulfilled by. Uh, the, so the because the margins are wafer, wafer thin in India and the margins are not, you know, and they have to be distributed across multiple levels. The only way we believe that this can become success, successful is to uh, provide a large number of services and products for the agents to make revenue from. So fixed cost but variable revenue depending on the product and services that we provide. Sorry, a long answer to a short question. The short answer is the revenue model is commission only. <clears throat> Just one one last question on my side. This uh, threshold you're mentioning, to, we call it sometimes the, the transaction at break even point. Okay? How many transactions do your agent need right now uh, in order to to reach that threshold? On average, of course. Sorry, uh, I couldn't get the question. The voice broke in between. So could you please repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'll I'll, I'll repeat it. I, I was mentioning that we we call this uh, threshold that you are referring to sometimes the transactional break-even point. So that is the amount of transactions that, from the agent operator perspective, the the agent needs to make in order to still be part of the network, and so that you don't lose money while while servicing. That agent. How, what what is your actual uh, transactional break-even point? How many transactions do you expect uh, one of these good agents to make in order to keep them in the network? Okay, so we don't measure it on the basis of number of transactions, but we measure it on the basis of volume generally needs to drive through his Jana Cash point. Uh, and because there are multiple commissions across multiple services, differential uh, sorry, differential commissions across uh, 
multiple uh, services. So we have a matrix wherein we say that if the agent is doing X percentage of these kind of transactions and Y percentage of these kind of transactions, then a total of these transactions amounting to so much of uh, total volume will give him X amount of revenue, which is how this is how we track it. Great. Well, that, that is that is very very helpful, Mitnish. Thank you so much. We we have another institution um, in Rwanda who will share a little bit later, but we have um, quite a few other questions um, that are coming up, and so I want to get to them. Um, Pablo and Greg, uh, we had a couple questions about um, managing technology savviness of agents, especially um, in rural areas. So we have an institution that is working in uh, Laos and many of the agents in the rural areas uh, may be illiterate or, or maybe only use basic um, smartphones, uh, so, so uh, sorry, basic mobile phones instead of smartphones. So what's a way to, um, you know, deal with this or mitigate, mitigate against some of the, these issues? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. I think just to just to comment that I think the the capacity building and training of the agents is a big question for everybody, and there aren't any necessarily any easy or or miracle solutions. Um, we have seen the investment. Um, leaving aside the feature phone smartphone for a second, we have seen investment in the design of the smartphone user interface to be a big benefit in terms of being able to accommodate lower literacy, less tech savvy people, just making it much more intuitive. On the feature phones, there's not such an easy set of answers, but there is quite a bit of work being done by organizations around how to make the agent's life more easier, more manageable. Some of that's in the public sphere. I, I mentioned yesterday I saw a presentation for, from the design firm IDEO.org, which is doing some work in Uganda and <clears throat> I believe Tanzania around how to make the whole user, how to make the whole agent experience much easier. There aren't any necessarily any, any easy answers except to invest in it. Great. Thanks very much. Um, we had another yeah, question. On, on my, on, oh. on my end, one, one mention. I think that's a, a very important topic. And just one, one, one mention here. The, the, there might be some cases where uh, using uh, a separate terminal from the cell phone, uh, a dedicated but very low cost terminal at the point of sale, might make things a bit easier. There are uh, several Chinese vendors, and I know some from India too, that um, what they do is produce this, it's more, more like a cell phone inside like a bigger box. So they have bigger buttons, they have a bigger screen, although very basic many times. So uh, I, one of them, I don't remember exactly the, the manufacturer, but it's called BPOS, as in B as in Ben, uh, POS. Um, and these are very, very cheap terminals. They are not beyond, I would say, $50. And they they give even they are very basic. They give a, a bit more usability with bigger keyboards, uh, more colors in there. So that that's an option you you may want to explore. And I've seen uh, these uh, POS devices at work, and they they work uh, really in in conditions where other uh, others might not work. So that's something you could explore. Right, that's that's very helpful. We have several questions coming in about compensation uh, for for the agents as well as liquidity. Um, Gabrielle, are are you there? Do you want to ask your question directly? Yes. Can you hear me? We can. If you want to let us know uh, what organization you're with and your role. Yes. So my name is Gabrielle Rosenau. I work for IPC GmbH. German consultant company and I myself am involved in everything related to agric finance. So my question is relating to agents working uh, in agric areas and how uh, can we manage uh, their liquidity um, 
of the agent, especially when the clients are uh, like they are cocoa farmers or coffee farmers and they all will need fertilizer at the same time and they all will uh, want to put the money at the same time with the agent. How, how do you do? Is there some kind of solutions? And as a second part of that question, because we had several questions along liquidity, um, just talking a little bit about agent compensation and commissions as well, if you could discuss both of those issues. Yeah. Pablo, I'll just take a quick shot at the, the agent compensation and um, uh, and just to say it's a very tricky business because you've got pricing around three sides, right? You've got a price to the customer and then you've got a price to the agent. So what does the agent get paid on cash in or a deposit? What do they get compensated on cash out? And how do you get those commissions done right? It's, it's not, what do they get paid for opening an account? Um, and how you balance all of those things and balance the the fees to the customer is is a is a tricky business. In general, for every transaction, the customer, I mean, the agent should be compensated in some way because that's the most common way to incentivize them to do transactions for your institution. On the liquidity management in rural areas, that is a that is a huge challenge. Maybe maybe Pablo, who's starting some work on this might have some more answers. I don't have any quick or easy answers on that one. Well, thanks, Greg, for giving me the hard part of the question. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think it's a, it's a very, very relevant challenge, and that's mostly the, the basic challenge of uh, remote areas. How do you, uh, first of all, manage that cash, and, and second, the the let's say the concurrence or the, the seasonality of, of these payments is also a challenge because as you were saying uh, things happen the same day so if, if it's uh, if it's harvest time it's harvest time for everybody and not only for one person so uh, what we are seeing uh, that's uh, probably the, the most uh, the quicker answer to this is that uh, given that typical bran bank branches are very far away. Uh, what we are seeing are levels of uh, levels of agents in terms of having probably uh, an, an agent in the rural area. Then usually you have, have like a super agent, and then the next step would be the, the bank branch or the or the bank account. What we are seeing in this seeing in these more remote areas is that there are more intermediaries in the middle. So from the small town, you go to uh, see my super agent and then to a super agent. The, the benefit of this is that proximity for the agents to in order to replenish cash or, or, or deposit the, the cash they have collected, it, it is nearer, it is quicker, there is less downtime, but on the other hand, uh, there are more intermediaries, so the commission, which is usually fixed, uh, is, is split uh, in, in more ways. So, so that's a challenge, um, and what, what usually happens is that um, these commissions are are hiked, and they are they are more expensive for the to operate for the network because they have to pay to more intermediaries. And what we see in many of these cases is that government intervention, like for example in the case of Colombia, where they want to make these uh, remote access points uh, sustainable. So they are willing to subsidize and pay, for example, a, a fixed fee to supplement, supplement, sorry, the commission that is being paid uh, as a as a basis for the operational cost. Uh, so it's a challenge, and and we are seeing some government in intervention on that. Uh, and in the end, it is more expensive to operate, and that's what you have to deal with. Okay. Thanks. Great. Um, we, we have a few few more questions, um, but we have another institution in Rwanda. Um, Poli Poli and Claudine, can you hear us okay? I'm not sure if we have sound. Hi, how are you? Um, Koji, uh, if you could just share very quickly about the work that you're doing um, in agent banking, just a minute, and then maybe something that uh, was interesting and new that you, you maybe learned or a question that you had about the presentation that we saw. 
Hello. 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 Hi, we're here. Hello, hi. Hello, hi. Hello, hi. Claudine, we have a, a bit of an echo. Is there a way hi. to turn off? Very well, thank you. Claudine, if you can share your role in the institution that you're with. We'll see if we can get them back. Otherwise, we'll move to another question. Okay, well, we had um, Koji in Rwanda, and they wanted to share a little bit about their experience in agent banking, but we may move that discussion offline. Um, we have a few questions surrounding um, the different models, and so we've had quite a few questions on sort of you know, what models work best where, what models work best with um, what type of regulation. And we have a, a partner in Ghana. Kwaku, can you hear me okay? Did you want to go ahead and ask your question aloud to Greg and Pablo? Okay, Jessica, thank you very much. And if you um, could share what institution you're with and your role? Okay, so um, I'm Kwaku Champong. I work for Snappy Abbas Savings and Loans. Uh, currently as a corporate planning manager. So the question I had for Pablo was, uh, I, I kind of missed a, a few of the slides when he was going through the models. And um, I wanted to for him to elaborate a little more on the Kaiser model. Uh, it seems to me that um, uh, they, they, they are op operating their own proprietary channel, uh, but they, there was also a kind of a relationship with a telco. So could he kind of give us a lot more explanation of what the telco does in terms of the relationship they play in their agent banking model and uh, tell us a little more about their proprietary channel? Yes, thank you very much for your question. And it's a good point. I, I went a bit too fast maybe there. The, the relationship, it's, a, it's not any of any strategic type or any type of partnership. It's simply a service relationship. So, uh, what in, in practice how this looks like is that uh, if you turn around one of the very phone terminals that uh, Kaisha might use in, in more remote locations, and you pop out the the rear cap, you will find a MNO a SIM card that's enabling that POS device to be connected to their own proprietary platform, as you were mentioning. So th this is the uh, one of the main points I wanted to make. It is it is not that there is a a, a partnership of any kind, or they are doing any kind of revenue share agreement. There is nothing of that. But the pieces need to be there. If Kaisha did not have a, a service contract with, with with an MNO, they would not be able to operate this point. So the idea is that uh, depending on on who is leading on the operational and the business model the relationships will be of different nature and what and, and but you need to have them you need to have um, a wireless communication service if you are working with far away uh, remote agents Pablo quick question is the um, agent network manager a proprietary network for Kaisha or is that a network that also is shared with other banks no, in, in Brazil it's a very very interesting case because Brazil is probably one of the most successful stories in terms of agents. There are around 300,000 agents in Brazil that process uh, bill payments mostly, and uh, they do not share agents in any kind. So each bank has their own proprietary, proprietary sorry, uh, network, and they, they are not shared. Great. Uh, that, that's very, very helpful. Um, Pablo, did you want to speak generally a bit more about the, the models? Because we've had quite a few questions um, around those in terms of, you know, just generally speaking, which model works where, which model works best, with what type of regulation, um, if there's one, you know, type of model that works better in a in a better region, and my sense is uh, your answer will be it depends. Um, but if you have any other right. insights <laughs> generally into the models, I, I think that would be helpful. 
Um, and I do want to let people know that uh, we will continue this conversation with some of the unanswered questions on our LinkedIn group. So we do invite you to uh, join our LinkedIn group, the Capital Plus Exchange LinkedIn group. And if you have unanswered questions um, for us or for Pablo and Greg from CGAP, we're happy to facilitate that discussion. I mean, it just uh, one one brief uh, closing comment before I, I pass it to Greg. But uh, I, it's it's very hard to to generalize, as, as you were saying. But what what you are seeing is um, it has a lot to do with market structure. There, where you have a very highly organized retail chains, they usually end up playing uh, an an important role in terms of uh, being financial uh, agent network. Uh, there where the retail sector is not very well organized, uh, there is a big opportunity for aggregators, a uh, type of the oxygen style in India, where, where these uh, aggregators of access points and services on, on the top, let's say, on, on, of aggregators of financial institutions are able to, to organize and in, 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 some, in some way become an, an Uber of uh, retail access points and they can centralize them, coordinate them, interconnect them in a way that makes them very useful and very efficient for the financial sector. So, uh, and of course we're not talking about here about regulation, there are many aspects, but I would say it depends a lot on the, on the market structure and the stage of development. And that would be, I mean, it's a very long conversation, so thank you very much. Uh, and we can keep the conversation going by other means. And I would just want to pass it to Greg to make a, a final comment. Yeah, no, I, I don't have too much more to add. I think the questions have been great. I think they they're all the you know I think they're the right ones. Um, you know I think there's uh, I think the key question for financial institutions is really to know their own markets well, and what the what the opportunities are, where the efficiencies can be can be found, and I think then the question for a lot of financial institution is, do I build or do I buy um, into the agent network? And maybe it's both, right? In some parts, in some regions, you might be better in a uh, you, you might use the agent network of someone else. Um, in, in in certain environments or certain products in certain regions, you might want to build uh, your own agent network. Or, or manage it much more directly or have a proprietary agent network. Um, a lot of it depends on the regulations that, you know, what you're allowed to do, not allowed to do, um, and then what others are doing and how you take advantage of that. Um, I, I don't have too much more to add. I think the questions have been really great. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Pablo and Greg. We, we still have lots of comments and questions coming in. Uh, so uh, I do want to let everyone know that we will send you a recording of this presentation in about a, a week after this session. And as I mentioned, we will post something uh, on our LinkedIn group in terms of following up with the discussion. Um, and if you have further questions or you need some interventions or support in terms of doing this, um, please mention that in the post-webinar survey and we'll be sure to reach out and connect you with Greg and Pablo. So thanks very much again, Greg and Pablo, and thanks to all of our participants today.